I'm Courtney Taylor, curator at LSU Museum of Art, and I am joined by Bryce Bischoff, who was born and raised in New Orleans and earned his BFA in photography from LSU. What year was that, Bryce? Uh, 2004. So. 2004. <laughs> yeah. Um, and went on to earn his MFA at the San Francisco Art Institute. He currently lives and works in LA, um, Los Angeles, not Louisiana and um, teaches at Cal State Long Beach and Cal State Fullerton. And what's bringing us here tonight is that we have a piece of his in the collection, um, which you can see on this first screen. Um, and as usual, I just wanna hit a few housekeeping um, notes. I know uh, my colleague Sarah is helping facilitate this discussion and she's shared a link. If you um, would like to have closed captioning, there's a way to access that. And kind of the way we're gonna run the night is Bryce and I are gonna have a 20 minute talk. And during that time, you can you know, put questions into the chat um, and we'll be sure to hit those. Uh, once we get to the Q&A session after the 20 to 25 minute conversation, you'll also be able to raise your hand physically <laughs> and with the raise your hand function and we'll try and call on you and Sarah will be helping with that so that you can ask the question yourself. Um, so with that, um, I think, what we're gonna do is just start by really looking at this piece. Um, this is a piece that you created in 2009. And what I wanted to do is just go straight into it. It's on view right now in our contemporary gallery at the museum so people can see it. And I think a lot of people might wonder what they're even looking at. So before we really dig into kind of your process and, and the meaning behind the work, will you just tell us what we're looking at, Bryce? Sure. and and. Before I answer that question, I just wanted to uh, thank Courtney for inviting me and for the LSU Museum of Arts, you know, continued interest in my work um, over the years. And I really appreciate that. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my former mentor at LSU, Rainey Zeitz, that was in the photography department. So this piece that we're looking at here is, uh, first of all, a long exposure photograph. So it consists of uh, 30 minutes of time from when the shutters open to when the shutters close. And what goes on during that 30 minutes is movement, motion, and performance by me. Um, my body is involved in what you're seeing. Um, over the course of the exposure, uh, I'm introducing different colors and textures. And so as that exposure happens, these colors and textures build up during the course of the exposure. So for me, this is a really good way, a really interesting way to engage with where I'm photographing and what I'm building up, almost in a painterly slash sculptural way over the 30 minutes of exposure time. My camera's on a tripod and, and this is what we're looking at from inside of the Bronson Caves. Yeah, so we'll be digging into, you know, how you, your process and kind of the performance and materiality of it. But I do think starting with Bronson Caves is really um, a good place for us to start. So um, I'm going to show to this. So Bronson Caves is the site. But before we even dig into the site, I want to talk a little bit about your relationship to site and its relationship to land art, because your practice is you know, inspired a lot by land art. And this is the most um, well-known piece of land art that everyone, if you know land art, you know this piece. So will you talk a little bit about your work and how it kind of relates to land art? Yeah, I think a lot of my art is kind of the intersection of the aesthetics of science fiction and the ethos of land art. And what I'm looking at specifically at land art is thinking about the ways in which we affect the land. And this example by Robert Smithson is a very good example of this interventionist model where a mark has been made and a gesture is permanent in the land. And the way that I look at engaging in this type of work is through more temporal gesture rather than this long lasting gesture that was used with bulldozers. I'm more interested in not leaving a mark 
and doing something that will be for the camera and for the photograph. And these are great examples of some land art that I'm really inspired by and really philosophically very different than what Robert Smithson was doing with the spiral jetty. This is Judy Chicago's atmosphere works from the 60s and these are done in and around Southern California. And the gesture in the land are these colored smoke bombs that go off and then dissipate so many parts per million into the atmosphere. So that's the, the gesture and a day from when this performance takes place, it's gone, it's no longer there. So I'm really interested in that and the idea that these works exist in a very strong way by the index of photography. Yeah, so that's just a really, a really just a kind of a grounding for the importance of site in your work. Um, and then this is the specific site. So this is Bronson Caves, um, located in Griffith Park in LA. Will you kind of talk about how this is both as a site and a non-site and kind of what's at stake in selecting the site for you? Yeah, for, for me as a photographer, I'm an artist that uses photography. This site specifically was one of extreme interest to me because of its um, use as a filming location for over a hundred years. Basically, these caves were made and they were made as part of a mining company. The, the quarry that was on the left side of the photograph that we're looking at here was dug out to create roads for Los Angeles. So th these caves are completely artificial. And if you were to go down Bronson Avenue, which goes into Griffith Park to go to the Bronson Caves, you'd hit Paramount Studios. So the studio system and the, the picture industry in LA is so close to these caves that it was out of convenience that they have been used again and again and again as a filming location. So for me to kind of unpack that history, especially when looking through the lens of landscape photography, this is where the site of the Bronson Caves becomes really interesting to me. If you think about landscape photography and the American West, you know, those photographs are charged with, you know, this idea of manifest destiny and how, you know, critical or, or looking through that in a critical way now, given our perspective, is appropriate. And then also thinking about the movies that were filmed there. Um, who is the hero? Who is the villain? Um, what kind of special effects were created at this site that would add to the myth of what this place is? Um, and then, you know, kind of pulling back even broader than that, it's about the philosophy um, of a cave and, you know, thinking about Plato's cave and how we can only see um, into this darkness what is projected onto the wall of the cave. So I, I like all of those associations. And that's why this site is perfect for this project. I think at at this moment, I want to just like give a clip um, of the video that you've created that shows a lot of the film, um, the Western shot in Bronson Cave. So that's what we're looking at right now. Is it playing? So maybe while this is playing, you could just talk about how you went about this aspect of the project. I mean, the Bronson Caves is more than this photograph that we have at LSU Museum of Art for you as a project. You put a lot of research into this. Um, and I know, you know, a lot of land artists thinking about the mythology of sites or how we learn about sites through storytelling or through pictures or through cinema in this instance, but also kind of the banality of that, of that image we were looking at when you just encounter it walking um, in Griffith Park. You may not, you wouldn't know how much has transpired there. Yeah, and I, I think it's, equivalent to seeing something in person versus seeing it in a film. There's always this 
huge disconnect between your physical presence and experience than something that you see on screen. And this disconnect is something that is archived at this place. And this archive project that we're looking at here delves into the, the really interesting way that our representations of certain um, ideas around American culture manifested themselves at this at this particular space and so if it's not you know and we were looking at kind of the second wave of B, B movie westerns and now we're into this like age of like sci-fi and it's the second age of sci-fi where things were um, you know really pushed towards the space age uh, so th this is all really what the mirror is and the mirror of the site is looking back at um, American society and so all these representations of um, people and figures and events have that kind of context associated with them it's really our projections onto the cave that we are making them um, so the the film industry you know is still active there as we speak and if I would, you know, just casually go back to the site, um, more likely than not, there is a film shoot happening there within, you know, not in this time, of course, but in the past year, there's been many film shoots that have gone on there um, still. So it's not stopping, you know, it's in this archive project, I'm thinking is going to be updated every 10 years or so. Oh, wow. Just, just so that you have a, a larger context of um, the chronology of everything. Well, I'll pause that and we'll slide back over to your, your piece. Um, and I'm going to switch over to your website and start showing some more pieces from your series. But I want to start talking to you about kind of how you activate this site with your movement. Um, can you talk about the importance of movement and performance in your work and kind of how it operates on the site? Yeah, and you know, just like we were kind of looking at, and I think some of the most famous films that were shot there were, you know, the mid-century invasion of the body snatchers, uh, The Searchers, um, which was a, a John Wayne uh, movie. Uh, those are some of the more famous movies shot there, but I was very, as I was getting into the research aspect of this project, I was really interested in what was transpiring in terms of movement and in terms of uh, repetition at the site. So very literally, I put my camera on a tripod and I'm contributing to the movements that were made for a camera, you know, over the course of the site's history. So I'm moving for the camera just like an actor or an actress would or a monster or a CGI animation now in the digital age. So all of these things are, are coming into these photographs. And it's really about when I go to the site, it's almost like a jazz in terms of how I can pull movement and color together. And I, it's not like I know what's going to happen when I start the 30 minute exposure. I have a rough idea of what might transpire or at the result, but what I'm constructing for the camera is really a photographic object. It's an object that is only for the camera's vision. And there was a number of people that were at the site that would visit me all the time. You know, they would be walking their dogs and they would say, hey, this one looks like a dragon today, or, you know, and it would just be, you know, me, my body draped in, you know, different kind of colored paper, and I would just be moving. And it's just this, this slow, methodical movement um, over 30 minutes. And so during that time, it's actually a very, personally for me, it's a very meditative process. And, you know, you think about the history, you think about, the context, but you also think about the painterly and sculptural way that these colors and shapes are building up over time. And if you think about the dark room 
Um, and if you think about the photographic darkroom, this is almost equivalent to dodging and burning. It's, it's adding information to a specific area and subtracting information from a specific area. And it's all about light, you know? And that's what's really captivating for me personally about my continued engagement with this place, because this wasn't just a, okay, I took a photograph and now it's on to the next. This was a project that was a year and a half to two years of photographing um, steadily with my large format film camera. So seeing what would develop was something that continued to excite me. And I was really initially shocked and surprised by what happened. And then slowly over time, I got a sixth sense of what I would do in terms of movement and how it will be constructed in the photograph. So I was able to be more deliberate and more specific with what I was doing. Um, you mentioned earlier that the color we're seeing is color sheets. And I think that this image I have on the screen right now, you can really see how it is almost draped over your body. Um, I think it gives a good window into the process compared to the piece that we have into the, in our collection. Um, why is it significant that one image contains all of these movements? I think it's about the compression of time into one point and it's thinking about the metaphysical and how that place is used as any time, any place, um, and anything could happen there. So compressing all of these moments into one moment was something that I was really interested in that kind of proposal conceptually that a photograph can do, especially a long exposure photograph. And I teach my students about this where you can have a photograph that's made over the course of one year. You could have a photograph that's made over the course of five years. And thinking about photography in this cinematic way allows this bridge to happen in this project conceptually for me. So I think one photograph contains many moments and many, many movements. How did the history of the cinema or the movement maybe that you saw all these clips, were they like playing in your mind while you were moving? How did it kind of inform the movements you were making? There is some instances where there, there was a direct correlation between what I was doing with my body and what I saw happening in a movie. And then there were some instances where that connection was more subconscious or more, you know, just by chance. Uh, and I think that that's what's really interesting about this is that, especially here in Los Angeles, you could turn a corner and think that you're in a in a specific movie, but you can't put your mind on what movie it is. And there's filming locations all over the city. And if you connect it in your subconscious, then you, you realize that, oh yeah, that's this movie or that movie. Um, so it becomes a, a part of the larger kind of ocean of images that we have behind us now as you know image culture is so much a part of our daily lives well you've kind of touched on it you've talked about the long exposure and the 30 minute exposure but can you kind of walk us through what it takes to set up um, a shoot like this yeah you know i'm really responding to the architecture of the cave specifically and i'll put my camera on a tripod and I'll have some idea of the movements that I'll be doing. And I'll open that shutter. And then all I have to do is enter the frame that the camera is pointing towards. And then it starts. And I'm not worried about, you know, one of the earliest photographs uh, that was looking over a, a French boulevard. The only person that you see is someone at the corner um, stopping to get their shoes shined. 
and everything else is just completely erased with movement. So it was a busy boulevard, but all you see is this one person that stopped for the duration of the exposure. So during these photographs, people were coming in and out of them. And I wasn't really concerned with them ruining my shot or I didn't freak out and say, you gotta leave, what is going on? Uh, because the, the time frame that was involved here allowed me to be permanent and all the other movements to be temporal. Um, and that has a lot to do with how much I, you know, I really am passionate about photography because these long exposures were taken at dusk. And so if the sun was too bright, these exposures would be ruined. If, these, if the sun was down further, if the sun set and it was more into night, these exposures would be ruined. So it was always riding this line. And I love photography at, at its extremes because it's always riding this line between darkness and light. And what a photograph is that we can see is finding the proper exposure between the light and the dark. And so for me, I was able to find a moment that was a 20 minute window after the sunset that I could make these exposures. And I still, you know, work like this today. I, I love shooting at dusk and I love the, the potential of having these types of images be made where time is a little bit more slippery. What would it look like if we walked up on you? Are you, you know, are you holding the paper up? Are you like dancing? Oh, You're, uh, like, how long, complete how physical lunacy. is this process? Yeah, it's complete lunacy. Uh, you would probably walk away from me if you saw me doing this <laughs> because I'm not acting normal. <laughs> I'm not there to, you know, just recreate. And um, I have, you know, sculptural kind of color and sculptural texture draped around my body. And then I'm just moving slowly. And it's all about that buildup of time um, for these. It's like moving slowly, slowly building up the information into the photograph. And that's what I'm you know, very literally doing. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what was happening and you would definitely not see this. Um, and that's why this is something that is for the camera. Um, and it's a, what you would call like an in-camera special effect. Yeah, you've, you've talked to me about your interest in special effects and how it's kind of undervalued as an art form. And of course, special effects are mostly in cinema. Um, can you talk a bit more about kind of in-camera manipulation and just, you know, we're so accustomed to digital photography today, but your process is, is you know, very analog. Yeah, and I think that the, the way that the two can kind of come together is that for, for photography to have uh, this kind of caveat of truth you know it's like oh it's indexical there is something in front of the camera that I can believe um, that's always in question and I think the way that images function today that is in question even more than ever um, of taking something that you see in a photograph um, for granted is it been has it been manipulated has it not been manipulated and so because this is a part of photography from the beginning, um, you know, and I'm thinking about specifically spirit photography where people would hold, you know, seances and there would be an angelic figure that was a visitation into the photograph um, and how there is a connection that is visually made between the special effect and our expectations of a photograph. And what we don't know is great when you look at a photograph and you don't quite understand it. And that becomes a way that you can talk about something that is more complicated than simply shape, color, and something that's beautiful. So as you kind of deconstruct 
the the context, then you get to the meaning, and the meaning of the gesture um, is amplified by the site and the context of the photograph. So all of these things mean that the special effect in a photograph is a gesture that the artist can make. And that's why I pri prioritize it in my work specifically, because if I'm doing this with a brush in Photoshop, and if I'm like drawing it in, then there's this disconnect between the, the site and my body. And so that becomes something that is important to me and that I want to prioritize. Right, I, I know, you know, your, what your process does is even resisting kind of our ideas around photography as being indexical. Um, and land art really prioritized resisting, you know, objecthood or, you know, this being in a gallery and being an object that could be bought and sold um, or like, you know, an abstract painting. But um, while you definitely prioritize similarly like idea and process and experience over object, you are trying to retain the sculptural and the gestural. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the the sculptural is a proposal in my work and the proposal is never actually made into anything that you can experience with your own body um, the translation is that you have to look at the photograph with your body to get the experience and look at the proposal of something that isn't in reality it isn't there um, and because those things can um, kind of play with these traditional notions of what a sculpture is, it opens um, sculpture and gesture in photography as something that can talk about more complex issues that it, the index doesn't have to be relied on and you can actually talk about, you know, what this means in relationship to um, image culture, what, what this subject as a subject of a photograph means in relationship to uh, history. So for me, I, I really appreciate the, the intersection between these special effects or you know, the, the science fiction aspect of what my work looks like and then how this connects to um, you know, these more outdated ideas of a modernist artist that is working in a studio and making something with their hands, um, you know, and that, that becomes something that I'm interested in critically examining. Well, I think we're ready to turn it over and see if we have any questions from the audience. Let me see if I can pull up the chat. Um, we have a technical question here sure. um, about timed exposure and lens setting and use of flash. Oh, okay, so I, I'm shooting on a, a large format field camera and I have my f-stop all the way to f64. So those of you that are familiar with uh, photography and that terminology, it's a pretty um, closed down aperture. And the only light that I use is existing light that is on site. So the light is changing during the course of the 20 or 30 minutes, but there's nothing really that is, there's nothing that's added that isn't at the site already. Um, so for, for me, that's really, for this project specifically, um, that's an important part of kind of understanding the landscape aspect of this project is relying on the naturally occurring light. And then the shapes, the textures are capturing that light and then bouncing off and back into the camera. Thank you. Are there any other questions that are gonna pop up? Does anyone wanna raise their hand? Let's see, just 
just scroll through here. Well, I think while we're here, I'm not seeing any questions or we have one about what the optimum time of day for shooting is. Is it always at dusk? I know you mentioned dusk. Yeah, for, you know, I, I wasn't using any kind of, and I, and this is a little bit technical and I apologize, but I wasn't using any density filters and I wasn't, and you know, a density filter is just basically putting sunglasses on your camera lens. Um, I wasn't using any density filters. So my, my time frame to shoot for this project was um, right after the sun and I would just look at the sun and <laughs> that would be my, my uh, indicator where if, when the sun set over a specific hill, then I could start shooting. And so as long as that period of time after that was about 40 minutes of time, then I could uh, continue with, you know, making exposures that were proper. You know, I tried shooting after that, I tried shooting before that, and it wasn't working, it didn't work out. So, and I love failure as a part of it. Well, I know too that um, I was just going to share, go back to your website for just a second, just so everyone can see all of your different projects. But part of the Bronson Caves was also burning the remainders. And we have one of these pieces in our collection. It's not on view right now. Um, but this really does talk a little bit about this. It feels very sculptural because it's like on a plinth, um, mm -hmm. or it feels that way to me. Um, and why don't you tell us about your most recent series? Yeah, I think the, the most recent series that I'm doing right now is, um, well, if we go to, well, the most recent series I'm doing is in Red Rock Canyon um, in the Mojave Desert. And this is a site that's also has a complicated history that I'm engaging with. Um, it's about two hours north of Los Angeles. So that site has, you know, you're just driving down the road and you feel like you're getting, um, um, time is stopping and you're literally traveling back in time or forward in time. It becomes really interesting once you're at this place. Um, and so engaging with the, the, um, the history of this site has been really exciting. And I've been photographing there for uh, almost a year now. I've had a, another question come in, um, kind of about the long exposure process causing your body to disappear and become amorphous. How important or not important is the performance of your body and the presence of a human to these works? Well, I think the the corporeal um, and what is left over from a body is really um, has connected a lot of my projects as an artist. And so um, using my body is important because of that connection that we all have with that type of scale in art. And if we're thinking about how that relates to you know, photography, it's, you know, the most popular subject of photography is people. <laughs> and we love photographing each other. Um, and we love learning and telling stories in this way from each other. Um, so the corporeal for me is, is something that is a trace. And it's also the presence and absence at the same time of a body. Um, so this allows me to engage with the image without um, being kind of put into these genres of self-portraiture or portraiture in general. Um, and it just leaves the gesture and that's it. So the, the smears, the way that my body kind of disappears is all something that I'm interested in because of that erasure um, as a gesture. Um, we've had another guest ask, do you ever think about the Louisiana, Louisiana landscape and your early interaction with landscape here 
and how does that still relate to your relationship with the environment? Yeah, I, I think about that a lot. And when I was in my first year um, of grad school, I, you know, and, and my dad helped me out a lot with this one too, was, you know, there was this huge pinhole camera that I would photograph different um, sections of the coastline with. And I was really interested in this disappearing that was occurring at the coast um, line of Louisiana. And I wanted to see if the long exposure could translate in some sort of way that type of temporality that I'm, you know, that is um, a part of the Louisiana coast history. Uh, the other project that I, I did was uh, after Hurricane Katrina, my, my family was on the West Bank um, of New Orleans, and it's a, you know, a third generation dairy farm that's back there. And all of these trees just fell over after that storm passed. And there was a real sorrow there, but there was also a real need to kind of document and, um, kind of preserve at the same time. So with that same pinhole camera that I looked at the, the disappearing coastlines, um, I looked at these trees. So there's very intimate photographs of these trees that are around my family's um, farm. Well, I think if there are no other questions, I don't see any more coming in, then we, has a question. It says, in a world that everyone has a camera with them all of the time, as an artist, how do you build a career as a photographer artist? Do you work with a gallery? Do you teach or mentor people? What would you tell an aspiring art photographer? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm an artist that uses photography and there's you know, this relationship to the populist idea of the medium. And I love that about photography, that everyone is a photographer because they have a phone in their pockets and they have a camera on that phone in their pockets. Uh, so in that, you know, very populist kind of view, anyone can be an artist that uses a camera. and it always, and I think it's becoming more clear than ever that it's who's behind the camera and then it's who's in front of the camera that connects and creates the art that is in the image. And so a lot of the ways that I, you know, and I'm also a teacher, so I, I teach this idea of authorship with the camera and thinking about ways in which we can speak to our own truths as photographers and artists that look at who we are behind the camera and who we are photographing in front of that camera. And so the line of equity between the subject and photographer is something that I really stress in teaching uh, photography. and. A career in, you know, photography, for me, it's, it's something that many of my peers that are photographers find very lucrative because they can slip into these commercial um, jobs that often intersect with their art um, in a very um, interesting way. So, you know, you can't say the same for a painter, for example, you know. Um, you know, unless they're, you know, painting uh, portraits of, of people um, of, and, and selling those. But that's something that, you know, is really uh, leaves the photographer as an artist in a great dilemma. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, as I'm teaching the next generation of photographer artists, they can, you know, pick up that torch. 
Yeah. Well, I think this has been great. I'm so excited to have your work. Um, you know, I, I fell in love with it a few years ago. Our director included it in an exhibition that he curated at the museum and you were kind enough to let us share that video um, of film stills in the gallery. And I hope when we're able to have touch again, we'll add the iPad back um, to further contextualize the work. But I'm so grateful to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, we're gonna have future art session, art talks to be announced. I think we'll be focusing on landscape for a little while because we've recently reinstalled our landscape gallery to really juxtapose contemporary and historic works. So that's a great reason to visit the museum safely <laughs> um, right now if you can. And I wanna thank Art Bridges for supporting this program and ask everyone if you would consider um, donating to support our programming. Um, but other than that, I would just wanna one more thank you to Bryce and we can sign off until next time. Thank y'all, I appreciate your attention. Thank you.